Um, so welcome to the 70th, Comsoc's 70th anniversary. Before we get started, I would like to uh, recognize and have people see the presidents of Comsoc, and I'd like to call on the past, the present, and any future presidents of Comsoc <laughs> who know that there will be presidents to so please stand up so that people can see who you are. <laughs> if you, yeah. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a few with us in the room. We also have a few more with us online. Um, and if you have questions, you can see them. You can see who you should talk to. Oh, okay, another picture. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is, like I said, the Comsoc has been with us for 70 years, and that's longer than some of the people in this room have been with us. Uh, so there is quite a bit of history. This particular panel is brought to you by the History Committee, and the History Committee is chaired by Doug Zuckerman, who couldn't be here with us today, uh, but he's also a past Comsoc president. And I myself am a past Comsoc president from 20 years ago, uh, 2002 to 2003. Um, so you're going to, I hope, see history brought to life with some of the things that you're going to hear in this panel today. Um, I would like to call on our current president, Sherman Shen, to come and say a few words before we get into the actual speakers who are going to come up shortly. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Celia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm proud to be here celebrating Comsoc's 70th anniversary. It's Platinum Jubilee. And to recognize the contributions of members that helped Comsoc to evolve over the years. Originally founded in 1952, as the Institute of Radio Engineers Professional Group on Communication Systems, Comsoc has grown into a diverse uh, group of professionals that consistently work towards advancing all communication technologies for the betterment of the world around them. Over these past 70 years, Comsoc has expanded in its depths and the press and has proudly offered the latest breakthroughs, <coughs> cutting edge information and the research on communications technology. Through its many publications, conferences and the educational programs, we have grown to 30,000 members and over 220 plus chapters around the world. Keeping our connections <coughs> with members locally and uh, providing opportunities for new leaders to rise and uh, existing leaders to mature. Today, IGB Comsoc is the premier international organization for engineering professionals in communications technology and uh, information networking. We could not have achieved this status without the hard work and the dedication of our volunteers and the members. I would like to extend, uh, extend thanks to you, our Kamsa community, for all you have contributed and for the many pioneers of our industry who have paved the road before us. Please give yourself a round of applause. Today's session isn't just about us. We are honored to celebrate and recognize special volunteers whose contributions had a significant impact on Comsoc and all of our communications technology. These volunteers are Bob Lucky, Des Taylor, Lawrence Wang, Donna 
Shilling, David Bellinger, and the uh, alone Natural Valley. Although these gentlemen cannot be with us today to hear our thanks, we appreciate their accomplishments and the dedication. We also celebrate the time and the commitment of all of Comsoc's members and the leaders of the past and the present. At this moment, I would like to ask for a moment of silence in recognition of these individuals and their contributions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Celia, Doc, Xing, Wei, and the whole history committee for their time and the great effort to organize this special session. We have so much to look back on and celebrate and so much to look forward to in the years ahead. Thank you very much for joining us, joining us for this special session. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. And that is our current Comsoc president who was just speaking. Um, so as I said, this, this panel was organized by the history committee. They were doing many things at this conference. Uh, one of them, for example, is that we have a booth downstairs. I hope you can visit the booth. And in the booth, there are many things. One example here is a, a little uh, template which tracks the history of communications from 1800 till 2020. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm being told to make sure people can see this. <laughs> uh, so you're welcome to come and look. There are two of these two down there. You're welcome to come and take a look at the tablets that are there and, and see the material uh, year by year, many things in the history of Comsoc and communication. Um, so we, we have with us today uh, six, speakers who have agreed to talk about the history of Comstock and the history of communications, but to try to bring it to light in the way that by talking about those people you just saw, the, the people we lost this year. We'll talk about three of those people. Um, so um, you can see our speakers at the side here. And um, I'll do a very quick introduction of our speakers so that you'll know who's talking. Um, one first speaker that I'll talk about is Steve Weinstein. Steve is the 1996 to 1997 president of Communication Society. Uh, he's still active, and so he's got a lot of information about the, what's happening in communications. He's a past member also of the IEEE Board of Directors because our division director becomes a member of the IEEE Board of Directors and a past vice chair of the IEEE Awards Board. Um, and he was an early founder in chief, founding editor in chief for the IEEE Communications Magazine. Another speaker today is Len Kleinrock. And whenever I hear queuing theory, I think immediately of Len Kleinrock. Um, he's been very active in communications and the communications society for many years. And he pioneered the application of queuing theory to model delays in message switching networks. Um, and that, role, that work played an influential role in the development of ARPANET, which was the precursor to internet. So we'll, we'll hear from both Steve and Len. A third speaker is Vincent Chen. And Vincent was our president from 2020 to 2021. He is currently at MIT and he's another one who has been very active in communications and in Comsoc over the years. Um, uh, next speaker, an another speaker is Katie Wilson. Katie started in industry and she worked there for about 10 years. And then she moved into academia and she's actually been a professor in Purdue in the US and also in Sweden, uh, which is an interesting career. She served as editor in chief of Communications Letters from 2009 to 11, Associate Editor for the Transaction on Wireless Communications, IEEE Communications Letters, Transaction, many of our publications, 
and uh, she was director of journals and also vice president of publications for Communication Society. Um, so again, we have uh, another high contributor to Comsoc. Uh, the, the last speaker is, or another speaker is Nim Chung. He's the 2006 to 2007 president of Communication Society. He's a Telcordia fellow. He had various positions at Bell Labs and Bellcor and Telcordia. He works in optical and high-speed networking and network management, very active in Comsoc still, and also at the IEEE level where he's active on awards and the IEEE Foundation. And then we have Alex Gelman, um, and Alex has been very active in communication society also for at least 20 years, uh, mainly in the standards area. So that's my quick introduction to the speakers. I think we wanna give them the time and they will speak about the um, three of the people that we have lost who are very influential on our world today. I'll turn it now over to Steve Weinstein to do the first talk. Thank you very much, Celia, for inviting me to speak in this panel and for your very kind introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me? Am I loud enough? Yes. All right. Yes, you're clear. So my brief presentation, uh, rather than a straightforward tribute, is more of a cultural background introduction. Recollections of Bob Lucky and Bell Labs in the 1960s and 1970s. I was uh, uh, a staff member at Bell Labs in, uh, from 1968 to 1979. And this was uh, a, maybe the early part of the golden era of communications in which Bob Lucky played a very large role. Next slide, please. Bob Lucky joined Bell Labs in 1961. By the time I arrived in 1968, he headed our data communications department said to be the youngest person ever to be promoted to that level. Next slide, please. We worked at the huge new glass enclosed Homedale complex designed by the famous architect Eero Sarinen. It wasn't loved by everyone. Offices did not have outside windows, but it was in a beautiful setting in the countryside of New Jersey. We would often uh, walk that large loop around the complex after lunch. Next slide, please. This is a view from the center where the elevator towers are of one end of this four building totally enclosed complex. Sometimes you would come up in the elevator and uh, look in the wrong direction and it was easy to get confused about where your building was because the opposite corners were mirror images of each other. Next slide, please. Bell Labs was well-funded in those days of the Bell System monopoly. In addition to its direct costs, the carrier includes an allowance for a rate of return, a profit on the rate base or capital the carrier employs. Adding the direct costs and the rate of return allowance yields the carrier's total costs. The allowed the total allowed revenue or revenue requirement which the carrier may earn is then set equal to the total cost. Essentially, this was a kind of cost-based system subject to regulation by the Federal Communications Commission and state regulatory agencies. But in essence, it meant that the more money AT&T spent on Bell Labs, the more profit it made. Next slide, please. Bob's department developed technologies for voice band modems. That was the frontier in those days, building on his renowned 1960s work on adaptive channel equalizers. This shows a, a well equalized uh, eye pattern for a dial channel. Bob co-authored with Jack Saltz and Ned Weldon, the famous Principles of Data Communications book published in 1968 that launched the age of consumer data communication. Next slide, please. Modems were just beginning to advance beyond the 300 bit per second acoustic coupled modems of the early 60s. And this is one of those acoustic coupled modems. 
1,200 bit per second modems were developed, but the big project of the late 60s and early 70s was a 9,600 bit per second modem, introducing quadrature amplitude modulation and digital signal processing for the adaptive equalizer. I wasn't familiar with a finished box like this, but rather a rack of equipment that was under development. Next slide, please. Bob did not micromanage. He held Friday afternoon brainstorming sessions from which threads of research and development activity developed. He encouraged and facilitated interaction between our department, which was in a development division in Homedale, with the mathematical stars of the research division in Murray Hill. These were both in New Jersey, separated by about 80 kilometers. Next slide. He welcomed ideas from his staff and suggested some of his own. One suggestion was to consider the new Cooley-Tukey algorithm for the fast Fourier transform, which Paul Ebert, Jack Saltz, and I did, resulting in a paper describing computation-based OFDM, though not yet by that name. By the way, I have subsequently found out that Carl Friedrich Gauss uh, invented the fast Fourier transform 150 years earlier. There's nothing that's ever entirely new. Next slide, please. Bob was always curious about and willing to embrace exciting ideas and products. He did a lot of experimental work himself, including building personal computers. I also remember him picking up on someone's suggestion that we'd one day have a computer in a matchbox, effectively realized now in our smartphones. Next slide, please. But he was also ready to puncture pretension and preconceptions, including his own, about products people may or may not want. His droll columns, interviews, and conference keynote addresses were eagerly awaited. He had an interview with Bill Moyers in January of 1990, in which he said, I think I had the last picture phone in the world. There wasn't anybody left to call. You don't want to be the only one in the world with a picture phone. A picture phone was a bell system attempt to make a video phone operating through dialed telephone channels. You can see one of the early models at the lower left. Of course, another thing is a cellular telephone, which is along the same lines. We had these market projections that said you that there's a small market for phones in a car, but we were surprised and the market estimates were all wrong. Maybe you don't need it, but it turns out you want it. Next slide, please. He loved the Sony Walkman, which he described as generating music within his head. This product was the brainchild of Sony executives who loved music and wanted it rather than any market research. He was skeptical about the potential of artificial intelligence to mimic proper human behavior. I remember one talk in which he described this, <clears throat> this smooth mechanical voice of an imagined AI-controlled entertainment system, which he asked to recommend an off-color film, replying with a title that his wife had viewed and noting that, quote, her friend paid for it, unquote. Next slide, please. Bell Labs was a magical place 50 years ago, and Bob Lucky, a giant contributor to its success and a kind and thoughtful human being. He cared about how technology is used and what it does for or against us. He is missed by his colleagues and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to call next uh, on Len Kleinrock to also give us a few words about some history with uh, Bob Lucky. Thank you very much, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here. And Steve, that was a great presentation. You articulated what Bob had done both technically and personally in a fine way. I wanna pick up on some of the things you said. One phrase you used was, he loved embracing exciting ideas. And he did that not only in the technical world, but across his entire endeavor. And I had the privilege of being friends with Bob for over 50 years. And during that time, I was honored to know the public Bob Lucky and the personal Bob Lucky. There was so much love about both of them. Now, besides being a researcher, 
and a director at Bell Labs, Belcor, who is a lecturer, an author, a technology writer, a futurist, a visionary, an IEEE editor, as you heard, president of the Communication Society, a Marconi fellow, an IEEE fellow, an NAE fellow, advisor of the FCC, advisor of the Air Force, and received the IEEE Edison Medal and more. And he was a great biking companion. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about that in just a moment. But you know, everyone who knows the public Bob Lucky knows what an exceptional storyteller he was. He was realistic and genuine and humorous with a twinkle in his eye. Even when he was talking about writing about the most technical topics, he would take you down a storyline and then hit you with a perfectly timed, often self-deprecating punchline. For example, he was doing a presentation for me once in the late 90s and I was running it and we had foolishly allowed the speakers to bring their presentations on a floppy disk, which they would insert into the computer running the, the, the uh, display. And by the time Bob got up there, a virus had entered the system and began to distort the pictures because Bob was unaware of this. He was given this great presentation with highly technical slides, but the screen behind him was going to heck. It was coming, coming up with alphanumeric characters, strange items. And when Bob looked out at the audience, he saw this quizzical look on their face. So he turned around to see what was going on. He looked at this crazy screen and he said, what the hell is that? That was Bob. He was upfront, no pretense, you know, raw, pure Bob. But his attention to detail was legendary in both his professional and his personal life. He knew the intricacies of everything and everyone, whether it was technology, events, or people. And he remembered every detail, thought through every outcome, and noticed every nuance, and exploited them in his presentations in a beautiful way. Now, beyond this public persona, Bob was one of the most incredible friends I ever had. He was open, vulnerable, and authentic. He knew how to be a friend and how to have a friend. And while we enjoyed so many wonderful times together, some of my fondest memories are of the bike trips we took across Europe, as I mentioned a moment ago. Now, Bob meticulously planned the trips, yet we were somehow always riding lousy rental bikes in pure repair, which broke down everywhere, from the beaches of Normandy to the Irish countryside. And it seemed that every time we had a decision to make regarding directions, we usually made the wrong one. The net result is we got lost on every bike trip we took. What I'd like to do now is show you a video of clips of a presentation Bob made about our bike trips. It just says a lot about Bob. So can we throw up the video, please? Thank you, Al. Um, all those things that you decided that I did totally irrelevant this morning. I'm just an old guy on a bike. That's all. Uh, I've given a couple of another story, but we, I can't give you all the stories. Uh, it's always a moment of trepidation because you, uh, you have an un, unfriendly bike and an unfamiliar bike and one that's unwieldy because you've loaded it with all your equipment. We took all our equipment with us. Uh, and you can see how unwieldy it is because Len was taking this picture of me and his bike has fallen over and the left part over down here. Uh, that's Len's bike and it's so unwieldy, it's just fallen over. And you have to take idyllic things, but it was not so idyllic actually, because it was pouring down rain and all those horse drawn carriages that left manure all over it. And as we rode the bikes through, it just got splashed all over everything. So not so good after all. Okay, we're lost. This happened every trip all the time. You think, how can you get lost? You have GPSs. And I always loaded the trip itinerary onto the GPS, all the roads and everything, and it never worked, never. And we always got lost. You say, how can you get lost with a GPS and the map? Well, the GPS on the bike is only about an inch square, so you can't see where you are. And even the map, if you don't know the road you're on, and these are unmarked, un unmarked back roads, you can't find, you don't know where you are on the map. So it was a regular occurrence, and here we are trying to figure out where we're going. But there was a thinker. The best part of every trip was dinner. Uh, here we would celebrate ourselves with wine. We say, hey, we got through a number, another day. We survived, we're here, 
this is great, and the sense of accomplishment. So we get to Putney Bridge anyway, and we're ready to start our trip, and we're trying to mount the last things on our bikes, and Len is trying to mount the handlebar uh, bag on his bike. Now, the handlebar bikes, uh, bags we always use to carry our uh, things that we couldn't get stolen, so we always carried them with the, us when we walked around. So Len is uh, trying to uh, mount this bike, uh, this bag on the front of his handlebars. He drops a screw that holds the thing onto the pavement here and it bounces and goes through the railing and down to the sand along the Thames. So he's down there pawing through the sand trying to find the screw and it's taking a while and I'm, say, I'm thinking, Len, we gotta go, it's gonna get dark. We got miles to go before we get to our hotel. So finally, Len gives up and he comes back and he sort of jury rigs the bag. And throughout this whole trip, the bag was falling off and Len was working on new ways to try to attach this bag to his front. Finally, he gave up and used a bungee cord to connect it to the back of his bike. Here's a, uh, one of the signs for this bike path. And the signs are uh, like crows and they're, they're black iron signs. And this is, sign is pointing at the path goes off into these weeds. I was, and I'm sitting there, what the heck are we supposed to do? We're not biking through these weeds and stuff. There's nothing else. So we're biking on this path. And I have to tell you right now that it, it was incredible that we, in the week and a half that we spent on this national cycle path, we never saw another biker. So I think we were the only way. And lots of times we had no idea why are we, we don't know where we are and why are we going through here? Here we're going through a farmer's field and there are cows and stuff there that we had to push to open a gate to get in. And sometimes we were biking through people's backyards and stuff, and that seemed to be where we were being directed, but we had no idea. Uh, and the, the chain has fallen off his bike again, uh, even though he paid to have a nice book. So we're trying to find uh, Saint, uh, Saint, Saint Michel, uh, and we're lost. And incredibly, we run into a, a road sign in the middle of nowhere. And we are lost, so I'm looking at the sign, but the sign doesn't tell you anywhere where you are. So I had no idea, so we gave up on that. But, okay, we're lost again. We're trying to get to the Normandy coast up there, and this is a typical kind of thing. Which road do we take? And Len and I would, Len would say, we should go right, and I would say we should go left. And Len was usually right, because he had a much better sense of direction than I did. But whatever it was, he, he was right. The train back to Paris, from Montfleur. Uh, and this is another failure of planning. I, we had a lot of failure of planning. Uh, there is no train station in, in Montfleur where you can go back to, to Paris. So we actually had to take a bus back 30 miles away we had come in order to find a town where we could actually get a train. It's a fairy tale setting, but you have to see it as a biker. First place, pumping all the hills to get up to the top here. And then you plunge down. Our hotel is in the bottom down here. And you plunge down here and halfway down, you go through a, a pitch dark tunnel and the bright sunlight, you suddenly plunged into total blindness. Scary as all get out. And Len was talking about it afterwards too. I mean, he was really going fast when he went into it. And I don't know what would happen if someone was coming up in a car through it at that time. It was really scary. And then left one, but this time north and uh, going back to, toward uh, Harlem and, and, uh, and then Amsterdam, uh, there's something neat about being on a bike path uh, and just being out of all traffic and having this beautiful flat expanse to go through. But the fact is, after a while, it gets boring. And I'm thinking, I could be in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> what is, why am I in Holland doing this bike path? So, and you don't go through any little towns that are picturesque, anything like that. So there, a little later in the afternoon, we noticed that the, I noticed, that the river was going the wrong direction. I said, Len, something's wrong. This river is, fall, is flowing up and it was flowing down. And sure enough, we find we've been biking the wrong direction. And I don't know how we get turned around. So, uh, at the end of a long day, we reach a, a hill on the top, Vicenza. Vicenza is the bottom of this hill. And here's Len at the top of this, uh, this hill. And, and the town of Vicenza is down, and all we have to do is coast down a fairly steep hill to uh, Vicenza. Uh, Len starts out in front of me, and when I get down the bottom of the hill, I see that Len has crashed, 
and he's unconscious in, in the middle of the road and there's blood all around. Uh, Len ends up in the hospital and one picture, here he is a couple days later in the hospital with some unknown roommates. But you can see. So you get an a sense of the excitement when you travel with Bob and the fun and the self-deprecation and the engagement. I mean, in summary, I'd just like to say through it all, I learned I'd rather be lost with Bob Lucky than with anyone else. Bob, we miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Len, for a very personal view, but a, a good view of uh, Bob. I, we do have one more person who will speak about Bob Lucky, and this, this is a more recent uh, Comstock president. Uh, let's hear from Vincent Chan. Thank you, Celia. I'm glad to be able to uh, speak to you all about some of my personal experience with Bob. Um, you all heard that he was the technical stalwart, the visionary, and a great uh, 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 management in terms of uh, managing Bell Lab. Um, and also his uh, sense of humor, fun loving, and, and uh, the, his, uh, per, his uh, uh, personal uh, fondness of new innovative ideas. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, folklore and some of my personal experience about Bob. Uh, first, about his sense of humor. Uh, there was a folklore going around that in the new bell call when it was set up, two young engineers came to work in the morning and find the elevator very crowded and they're the last two person that entered the elevator. After the door closed, one engineer talked to the other. Did you see the young guy yesterday? I think we he's really good. I think we have met the new young Bob Lucky. It turns out, unbeknownst to these two engineer, Bob was actually sitting in the back of the elevator at the corner. And he suddenly chimed in and said, I too at one point have seen the young Bob Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so that's his sense of humor. <laughs> uh, one other thing which he combined, he likes to combine his personal life with uh, his work. So he has a very uh, cute little dog, white fluffy dog, I forgot the make of the dog. And uh, he <laughs> likes this dog very much. One day he was working on his house, which he likes to, and then he went want to go to the hardware store to pick up something. After he spent a half hour in the hardware store, came out and found his dog right outside sitting, waiting for him. He said, Leash, what are you doing here? Come home with me. So he picked up the dog and he went home. So he opened the home's door and found his dog actually <laughs> greeting, and he has somebody else's dog. <laughs> okay, so instead of just leave it at that, he keeps thinking about the incident and he come up with the following idea: If we actually put a web webcam and a GPS on the head of every dog and let them roam around the streets. They can probably report what's going on in the street and we have a problem, we can query the dog. So indeed, he probably was the first person to invent Internet of Things. So I think uh, it, his mix of personal life and technical life is uh, incredible. Also, Belko, for some mysterious reason, when he was uh, ahead of it, uh, sponsored Sail America, the boat. And his staff said, what do we have to do with sailing? He said, no, let's uh, get some real-time telemetry from the boat when we were testing. And then we'll bring it back and then we'll simulate. And then we'll try to improve on the performance of the boat. So there he makes personal life and enjoyment with actually uh, uh, tuning of a, a very high-tuned racing machine. Fast forward. In every Formula One car racing and Indy car racing, they have real-time telemetry of all the parameters of the racing car and the temperature of the track and all that. And the tuning actually is no longer after 
the fact the simulation is done real time and the tuning is in situ. So this precedes, his idea precedes this by at least 20 years. So the last one about his uh, sense of humor and, but also his uh, uh, not so much interested in management is the following story. Um, for some reason, when the staff talked to him in his later days, it's always good for discussion of innovation, new ideas. You can go on for, for forever. Uh, there was a case where one of his uh, young manager actually come and talk to him about some new ideas. And he was very happy. He talked to him for half an hour. And then the young uh, manager said, but I have a question that I want your advice on. It's about a management issue. And at which point Bob stood up and said, I need to go to the bathroom. He left the room and never to return. <laughs> One of the conjecture was he sort of partially blamed himself uh, as the manager for failing to convince the Congress to not divest Bell Lab. Um, he had the chance to uh, brief the Congress uh, in a final uh, uh, briefing to prevent this from happening. But I don't think there's nothing, really, there's nothing he can do about it. So I want to give you one incident of a personal uh, 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 interchange with Bob. In 1992, um, well, way before that, actually the Soviet Union disintegrated and peace broke out. So the defense budget then was coming down. And the question uh, by the US government is what happened to the great innovation engine called defense research after the Cold War is over and the budget comes down, how are we going to develop new technology and spin off into the commercial industry? So Clinton come up with this idea of dual use technology where actually the partnership between defense and commercial sector would develop new technology and the defense would actually rely on the commercial sector to build and uh, update this technology and buy back from the commercial sector. So we had proposed together with AT&T and Digital Equipment Corporation, a, a first dual use technology on optical networking. So we went back and forth and eventually DARPA got the money and we were ready to sign on the dotted line. Uh, it called for actually matching funds from AT&T uh, to this particular program. And we were having a lot of trouble uh, with the corporate lawyers. There are actually 23 business units, and each one have their own set of corporate lawyers, and they all want to know whether they're going to own 100% of the intellectual property in this consortium. And so I think that the, I was the leader of this uh, team, and I talked to Bob and said, we got to find a way to get past this impasse. And he said, yes, Vincent, but you have to tell me first, we have been working on optical network all these years. Tell me what, uh, what is it that you're doing in this consortium with us that we are not already doing, okay? If, if, if there's nothing new, why should I contribute matching fund? That's a really valid technology. At that time, he is facing a really uh, big uh, marketing problem where uh, they have T1, which is 1.5 megabit per second. And his manager told him they can't even sell T1. And we were talking about 10 gigabit per second, gigabit to the end user. And he said, what kind of application would require this kind of rate? So I know I cannot just uh, 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 convince him based, based on numbers and performance alone. I said, well, I think if you think about using video conferencing, to do business transaction and serious business discussion, um, you can use the low rate video and the low quality audio. You need to have very high quality and uh, so that you can actually negotiate and understand what the other person are talking about and his body language. So he said, well, what do you think is the criteria for a serious business discussion over video and network. I said, well, Bob, I know you're a great poker player. He always go to information theory and on the side as a poker game. I said, if that video 
is good enough to play poker with, then it's good enough for uh, business negotiation. And he actually agreed immediately. He said, yes, I know what to do. So it actually immediately, he called the 23 lawyers and said, I want to sign the agreement next week. And that's how it was done. So Bob, when he put his mind to whatever he wants to do, he would go do it. And I'm really uh, at, at, at admire his, uh, his pace. And when he's convinced, he just go do it. So this is actually uh, something that I learned from him very much. We, ex uh, we respect him so much at MIT, me and my colleague, um, uh, Bob Gallagher, Bob Kennedy and the MIT president. Actually, this is a fact that's probably not known to anyone other than a few. And I'm reviewing for the first time. I hope Bob doesn't mind. Uh, we, we admire him so much, we make him an offer to come to MIT uh, to lead or coordinate an effort among all the uh, EE people, electro engineer, computer scientists, and also media lab people. Uh, it was actually a very interesting offer that he would be coordinating almost half of the research of the engineering school of MIT and beyond the engineering school. However, at that time, he began to have bad health this 20 years ago. And after a few conversations, he said, well, because of his health reason and the fact that he's remodeling the house uh, right next to the river, he doesn't feel that he has the energy nor the incentive to come. So we miss him badly uh, because he could have done a great job for us uh, doing the coordination. Fast forward uh, to the end. Um, uh, in the last year, I had the opportunity to talk to Bob a couple of times on the phone. Uh, in, besides uh, the, talking about old times, I've asked him for advice on how to deal with some difficult policy issue within the society. And his advice was very clear and succinct. And he basically said, well, you have to figure out what is uh, uh, what is the right thing to do and you have to have the courage to do this. So uh, in summary, I'm actually a big admirer of Bob. I'm actually very grateful for his guidance all these years. I, don't, I hope all you young folks have the chance to uh, actually meet Bob. Maybe someone's writing and his video would help a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. I hope for everyone that these three wonderful speakers have helped to bring back to life um, Bob Lucky, one of our grand contributors to communication society and to the communications industry. Um, we'll switch gears now and we'll talk about somebody else. Um, and this, in this time, we're talking about someone who has made strong contributions to the publications of communication society. And that's Des Taylor. And I'd like to call first on Katie Wilson to give us a few words about Des Taylor. Thank you, Celia. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm, I'm honored to be here to talk about Des. And I first met Des in 1998 at the Com Theory Workshop. And um, I was a youngish researcher, not, not necessarily young, but I was youngish. And Des was just friendly and, and nice. And after that, we, we formed sort of a, you know, email kind of how you doing or see each other at conferences. And he hired me as an associate editor for Com Letters, and he mentored me. He helped me understand how to be a good editor. In addition to that, he was always available for advice. Sometimes I didn't want to hear the advice, but it was great advice, and I was glad he gave it to me. So he was very fatherly in that sense. Um, he took on, there's a lot of service positions that some people from outside say, oh, that's glamorous, look at that. But Des took on positions that weren't glamorous, but so necessary. So for example, um, if somebody, if an author behaved badly, committed plagiarism, that sort of thing, horrible, you report it. And part of the procedure was it would go to a committee that Des was on. And so Des dealt with a lot of naughty problems and issues of plagiarism. 
but it's not something that that has high visibility, but it is so important. And I think that speaks to Des's dedication to service and doing a good job. Um, when he died, and I heard about it, I was, of course, very upset, but I was also, we were, we were sending emails back and forth on, on, you know, what, what, you know, what we remembered about Des. And as we were sending emails, the email CC list got bigger and bigger because more and more people wanted to contribute. So it was people from, uh, you know, UCLA, New Zealand. He, he mentored Philippa Martin, who's awesome uh, in her position, uh, which was Des's old position. And people just started wanting to contribute all the nice things Des had done for them. So... I'm going to be short and I hope sweet here. Des was a generous man with his service and his time. And he he took the time to take young researchers and give them excellent advice. Not always advice we wanted to hear, but advice we needed to hear. And I'm I miss him very much. So that's that's my comment on Des. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And that gives a, a nice, uh, a different background view of some of the things that some Comstock volunteers and IEEE volunteers have to do sometimes. Um, yeah, we'll, let's hear a little bit more about uh, Des Taylor. We'll hear from Nim Chung, who's a, another past president of Communication Society. Yeah, uh, thank you, Celia. Can you hear me? Yes, you're clear. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Celia, for inviting me to share uh, some of my old experience. Um, actually, uh, Des uh, was one of the two mentors that introduced me to Comsoc and IEEE. That was, I, I think, it's in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, my first volunteer job in uh, Comsoc was the senior editor of JSEC. Uh, at that time, there was a small club of JSEC, uh, they, they, they don't publish like the transactions and others uh, where people submit the papers. They, they are organized by inviting guest editors. Each guest editor is responsible for the whole uh, uh, issue, the whole uh, uh, series and so forth. So quite often they are inexperienced and then uh, uh, the publication went into trouble and the uh, uh, senior editor and the editor in chief at the time was Bill Tranter, uh, was to save save the the ship at that time. So we scramble around the, uh, to find out what's wrong. And sometimes, uh, like like Bill and uh, Des and I, actually have to uh, read many papers and review the papers. So that was uh, the so called the good old days of publication. We met twice a year at the uh, GLOCOM and ICC, the editorial board. So at that time, uh, many of you know the editors, uh, besides Bill Tranter, the Des Taylor, uh, Dave Sinkowski, the late Dave Sinkowski, um, and uh, uh, Lamb, uh, 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 I, I forget his first name, uh, Lamb was uh, the editor. And, and then later on, we were joined by this uh, young, uh, Ted Rappaport, <laughs> even though Ted is no longer young at this, this moment. So we had a great time uh, gathering together. And actually, the fun begins after the editorial board meeting. Uh, uh, so, so there was a famous bar hopping. The tradition actually lasts until today. So uh, the group actually went to the different bars in town and then hopping uh, 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 go to each bar until, until uh, we were thrown out and then we went to the next one and next one and so forth until the wee morning and some of them catch a plane uh, at uh, 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning. So uh, I, I, I recall Des did not uh, participate in the bar hopping that much, but he did uh, enjoy some of those uh, events. Uh, well, uh, after that, then uh, I we launched on a big project around, that was at the 50th anniversary. So we were to select the best 50, pay, 50 papers 
uh, uh, published by Comsoc. So that was a tremendous uh, amount of work. Uh, and this, and working with Bill Tranter and the other editors actually did a marvelous job uh, to select the 50 papers. So I'm wondering now with, we have the 70th anniversary, we have something like this, uh, 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 selecting 70 uh, papers. But uh, overall, uh, we had a good time with this. And oh, I, I forget to mention that at the time he was working at Christ Church in the Southern Hemisphere. And it, it took a long way for him to, uh, to come to the Northern Hemisphere for the, most of the meetings. Uh, so uh, I'm very sad to uh, learn that uh, Des passed away this year to, uh, besides the uh, other old friends like uh, Bob Lucky, who was my uh, immediate supervisor uh, in Belcor. Uh, and, and to my surprise, I just learned that uh, from Celia that Lawrence Wong, and also uh, uh, Dave Ballinger also passed away because I had a video conference call with them just a few months ago. Uh, uh, Dave was uh, actually gave, gave a long presentation on his work on data science uh, at the IEEE Foundation. So all of a sudden, uh, our old friends uh, left this world and we miss them a lot. Uh, so, so I would like to stop here and we miss all the pioneers of the uh, console. And we learned a lot from all these uh, great individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Nim. Um, and uh, again, we have, have another view of some of the things that the Comstock volunteers get to do so that we have very strong, good quality publications available for all our members. Um, and I think that was also, I hope, a good view of, of Des Taylor and the work that he's been done, doing for Comsoc. Um, you did see at the beginning that there were six people that we lost this year. We don't have time in this panel to talk about all of them, but we did want to speak about one more, and that's Don Schilling, uh, who was a Comstock president back in 80 to 81. And so we're going to go back to um, two speakers about Don Schilling. I think they're going to uh, trade off between the two of them. And that is Steve Weinstein again, and Alex Gelman. So let's hear from Steve and Alex about Don Schilling, one, another one of our past presidents. Thank you, Celia. Uh, has Alex been admitted to the session as a panelist? Is he there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Good, Alex. So you'll have uh, a chance to participate then. I'm glad it worked out. So uh, we'd like to give a, a brief tribute to our very dear uh, friend and long-term colleague, uh, Donald Schilling, uh, who died very recently. He was an uh, Comstock president in 1980-1981. Next slide, please. Alex and I are, are honored that, that Donald Schilling's wife and business partner, Annette, also our good friend, and their children, Laura, Stacy, and Michael, and possibly other members of their family are viewing this brief but heartfelt tribute. Next slide, please. Don Schilling uh, was a longtime professor at the City College of New York. He educated generations of students in electronic circuits and wireless technologies and became an inventive innovator of broadband CDMA technologies. He was a leading volunteer in Comstock, including serving as president. He produced, uh, often in uh, conjunction with colleagues, uh, many important books, papers, and innovations. And this is just uh, illustrating a few of them. His book on electronic circuits, discrete and integrated, and uh, patents on various aspects of uh, spread spectrum, and uh, articles, for example, uh, that were for more than just specialists, but uh, trying to spread these ideas among a wider audience, as in this article, Broadband CDMA for Personal Communication Systems, which appeared in Communications Magazine in 1991. Next slide, please. 
Don was a very successful entrepreneur. He co-founded with Annette a consulting company, SCS Telecom, which operated from 73 to 92, and where he invented many, uh, many of his uh, inventions in the area of broadband CDMA. The company also offered popular short courses for government agencies and industry. He was subsequently CEO of Interdigital Communications Corporation, developing and licensing the CDMA inventions that he had come up with. In the late 90s, Don was board chairman of Golden Bridge Technologies, where he initiated a wideband information management standardization program with AT&T. Golden Bridge advised the T1A 46.1 committee for 3G and through that, the 3GPP broadband wireless standards. His final executive job uh, in 2019 was as chairman and CEO of uh, Linux Technologies, which developed patented technologies for MIMO, spread spectrum, 3G and mesh networks. Next slide, please. And for CompSoc, in which he was very active for a long time, Don was especially interested in CompSoc publications. He was editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Communications and then director of publications from 1968 to 1978, in which time he encouraged the development of communications magazine from what was a newsletter. Uh, he was my boss during that period when I was uh, EIC of communications magazine and initiating the publication of JSAC. As Comstock president in 1980-81, he launched the MILCOM and Infocom conferences. He led a Comstock delegation to China in 1981, initiating an early effort at cooperation and friendship in the optimistic spirit of that time. Next slide. This is a photo of our group arriving in China in 1981. And Don is the uh, handsome fellow at right with a, a white shirt and uh, and not shaven for a couple of days. And Annette is just below him. And that's my wife, Judy, on lower right. Next slide, please. As a mentor, colleague, good citizen and friend, Don was generous and understanding, always ready to share everything in his life, which took in knowledge, travel, weddings, and good meals. His contributions strengthened the Communications Society, the United States, and the World Communications Engineering Community, and helped make the wireless revolution come when it did. His friendship and inventive spirit was something we treasure and will always remember. Next slide. Alex, you may want to speak about uh, what happened at this conference and any other recollections you may have of Don's uh, character and activities. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so uh, I'm running this conference, CCNC. This is a CAMSAC portfolio conference. We started it in 2004 and it's still running. And in 2013, I uh, asked Don uh, to give a keynote. We needed to raise the caliber of the conference. And so I tried to invite him and it's right uh, it's like a first or a week of uh, first second week of February, very close to the New Year, and he said, you, "You're telling me that I have to kind of fight my hangover at your conference." So I kind of pleaded with him. He finally agreed. It was a great visionary speech about wireless communications, wireless consumer communications. A lot of the concepts in consumer communications we see now. Uh, I was very grateful to Don. It really um, gave a, a boost to uh, our conference. Uh, in general, uh, you can see from Steve's presentation that uh, he put his hand on the best publications in Comsoc and the best conferences. Uh, Harvey told me how the Infocom was uh, was created. Uh, uh, Don and, and uh, president at that time of Computer Society, they kind of gung up on, on Harvey and said, uh, you, after Harvey gave a tutorial on a local area networks, they gang up on him and said, you have to come up with a conference that both societies could support in, in a consumer in computer communications. And uh, that's how Infocom was born. 
So <laughs> he was a very vision, a visionary guy. Uh, I remember <laughs> going with him to a workshop in Rutgers. It was very early days of wireless uh, telephony. And he was evangelizing uh, CDMA for, for wireless telephony. And it was a shock to people. And they were all uh, spectrum experts. And it was a shock to them. And I remember one guy with a beard said, Don, I'm making, I'm making spread spectrum receivers. And my knob on the receiver costs $2,500. So, Don, <laughs> so we're going to not put your knob. We will not put your knob on a, on a CDMA telephone. What can I tell you? Uh, <clears throat> and he, uh, he was very, uh, to, for full disclosure, he was my thesis advisor. <laughs> and uh, for, uh, he was very, very strong, uh, good teacher, but a very strong pedagogue. You know, he, was, he pushed uh, his students to the limit. And uh, sometimes he was sarcastic and he loved to kind of make fun of students that uh, couldn't, uh, didn't excel, didn't, do, didn't perform to his expectations. But he had a huge, humongous heart. Uh, what he did for students, he treated them like, like his children. Uh, he gave shelter in a, in a, a lab. I can tell now, probably, <laughs> he, will, he will not be punished for this. In the lab, uh, almost basically a homeless student from Egypt, he gave him a, a, a shelter in the lab, and he lived there for a while until he found uh, a place to live. Uh, I, I heard another story where somebody came from Iran and he uh, called, invited him to his house to spend the night because he didn't have where to go. I don't know if it materialized or not, but that's that's that was the story. Uh, he did support, uh, to me, he did more than anybody could do. I had to work basically full time to support my family and do my PhD. And he kind of covered for me if I didn't come to a faculty meeting or uh, could, could make it to, to some event and uh, he would call me and say, okay, Alex, I sent you to this and this workshop. Okay, so we lie together. <laughs> and I'm grateful to him uh, for being such a critical part of my life. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I'll never for, uh, forget him. He'll be my friend till the day I die. Thank you. The next slide, please. So uh, from Alex and me, we want to say uh, thank you, Don, for everything you contributed to our lives. Let's to take I-95 North and I-93 South, I-93 South Express Lane. What is that? That was a navigator, ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we'd like to uh, say we really are grateful for what we received from Don Schilling. Uh, thank you. It's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Alex. Um, and in fact, I, I want to thank all the speakers who have been speaking about people we've lost. And in this last talk, we also looked not just at publications, but we heard a little bit about the conferences as well. Um, I hope it brings a bit to life the kind of people that work in communications and the kind of people that work for communication society. Um, and I hope that that gives a good, good picture of things that have happened through our past and that the future will continue on the same sort of positive note. Um, I don't know anybody who is not overly active already doesn't probably know, but this feels like a family Comsoc. It's I think all of us who work here think it's our family and, and people are very close to each other, as you can see from some of these talks. Um, we actually almost had one more speaker today. And it was a, a Comsoc president who was president approximately 40 years ago, but he had a conflict come up in the last two days, so he wasn't able to be with us today. But there's still a lot of people from our history who are very active, uh, and we really appreciate uh, hearing from them and seeing what they're what they're working on. Um, all right, we we will we'll change gears for the moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about two more things. One is something else that the history committee is working on. And then the second one will go back to some information about more information about our 70th anniversary celebration that's happening here at this conference. So um, this slide is talking about a potential process or a possible process. The, the history committee thinks that it does help to bring some of our history to life 
if we can talk about people or recognize people who have contributed to Comsoc and to communications. Um, and up till now, we've had, we, we do that. Uh, there is uh, an online, if you go online and look for uh, people, a memoriam, something like that in Comsoc, you will see information about some of the people who have contributed. Um, but it's been very informal and there hasn't been any way for people who aren't close to be able to, to get a name in here or to help us to realize that maybe we want to do something. So we're talking about a process where people could nominate somebody. We've just lost so-and-so. Uh, does Comstock want to do something to recognize this person? So we're looking at a, a, a nomination form that could come in and that form would explain what this person did for Comstock and what this person did for communications. And um, that would then go to various places within Comstock to be reviewed. And if it is decided that we should do something, we're proposing that have various levels. And so here we have exceptional, general and limited levels. I don't know if you can read those smaller words. Um, uh, because for some people who have made bigger contributions, we might do more than, than some people who have done a lot of work, but maybe nowhere cl close to what some of the others have done. Um, if it is decided that we should recognize that person, then we would ask the Comstock president to go to the family before we do anything. We don't want to publish information about somebody unless the family is okay with that. So the Comstock president would clear that with the family. So this is the sort of process that we're talking about. We'll hopefully have something in place shortly so that we, we will be aware. Um, when, for example, the, the Don Schilling information we found out about three days ago, we had to scramble to get something here for this today. And yet he was a very strong president years ago. Um, so that's one thing that the history committee is working on. Let's go to the next slide because the history committee is working on many things that are related to this 70th anniversary celebration. One floor down from here, there is a booth. It has nice, lovely couches where people are welcome to come and visit the booth. It has um, a, a big screen with a video showing the history of communications field and, and some of the history of Comsoc. So you, you're welcome to sit and watch it or stay for a while and see part of it. Um, there are the tablets that I mentioned earlier where you can scroll through. This one's turned off now, but I showed it earlier. Uh, you can scroll through and see some of the history of communications from 1800 till now. Uh, the, there's two tablets there and, and you're welcome to come and poke through them if you want to. Um, there are copies of the magazine. If you don't have one yet, there are copies of the magazine to pick up there and not just communications magazines. There's two or three others if there's still copies left. Because <laughs> um, people have been picking them up. Uh, there are volunteers at every break, volunteers staffing that booth for anybody who has questions about Comsoc. Uh, and some of our past presidents will be there. Very active volunteers will be there uh, to help answer questions. There are more of the 70th anniversary pins. You should have received one in your bag, but if you don't have one, there are more of them at the booth or if you want extras for somebody else. There's also a flyer talking about the educational offerings that Communication Society offers. Um, another thing that the History Committee is working on is a book. There's a book on um, the history of Communication Society. It's available now online, but it needs to be updated. So there's work going on to update that and it will come out sometime soon, <laughs> soon we hope. Uh, so there'll be a new version of that. So that's just a few of the things that are happening in one committee in Comstock and there's the technical committees, there's a more administrative committees looking at conferences, at publications, at standards, at serving industry, a lot of things happening. I hope that uh, People will, will volunteer to come and work with the, those Comstock members who are working on some of those things. Um, we can always use more help. I'd like to thank the History Committee. It's a not huge committee, but they've done a huge amount of work to prepare for today, for this panel, for the booth, and for, all, for these other things that I'm talking about here. Um, thanks to, and also we've had a huge amount of support from Comstock staff. Couple of Comstock staff are here. Can you stand up so people can see who you are? I didn't, they didn't know they're getting asked to stand up. 
And there should be some Comstock staff over there too, to stand up so you can see who's helping us. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Sherman for allowing to have this panel and for coming to open the panel here as well. So again, if you're not a Comstock member, how about signing up? <laughs> Uh, if you are, how about volunteering? If you're not, sign up and volunteer. Uh, we'd love to have you in our family. And thank you very much for coming today. And thank you to the speakers. I think you're all still there. Uh, it was very enlightening and I enjoyed listening. I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. We have, we have no mechanism for questions. If we want to ask the people online questions, we have no mechanism for that. If people have questions here, Herman's over there, he can answer them all. <laughs> Thank you. That's the end of the session then. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Well done.